Amen. Thank you. Well, it seems like it has been and taken a long time to get here. Uh, I know the search committee feels that way. Some of their faces out there. They did some hard work. It's good to be with you today in person and good to be with you for those that are still at home online. What an incredible day for a new start for Kings Highway Christian Church. And uh, I'll, I'll be selfish and say a, a new start for the Lesher family. It's Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. It's a day we celebrate new beginnings. And what a new beginning to celebrate for all of us. I, I want to start. I have a question for you this morning. Is this a Bible-believing church? I'm going to say that is a no. <laughs> is this a Bible-believing church? Yes. There we go. Thank you. Uh, then this morning, I don't need to spend any time telling you what you already know. No matter how long you've been in this church, no matter how long you've been a Christian, uh, if you only come to church one or two Sundays a year, you know what this day is about, right? Yes. You, you know what this day is about. So I'm not going this morning to tell you about what you already know. I, I want to tell you this morning about what you don't know. What you know is, is what you've studied and read probably your whole life, right? Uh, if we look in the Gospel of Matthew in the 28th chapter, and you know this, and if you have your Bibles, I'm not seeing a lot of Bibles, but if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me at home if you have your Bibles. I invite you to, to turn with me and keep up. Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes white as snow. The guards were afraid of him, and they shook and became like men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, he's risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he is risen from the dead, and going ahead of them into Galilee, there you will see him. Now I've told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. You know that, right? That, that's familiar. You already knew that. If we flip over to the Gospel of Mark in the 16th chapter. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, Who's going to roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. They're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Familiar, right? You know this. We've heard this before. Flipping over to Luke, the 24th chapter. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were there wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes with gleaming like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down to, to their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. They remembered his words. Right? This is all familiar. You know this. And lastly, from John's Gospel, the 20th chapter, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. 
put the other disciple out, ran Peter, reached the tomb first. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. And then Simon Peter, of course, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He, he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scripture that Jesus had to raise, rise from the dead. All this is familiar, right? You know this. So I don't need to preach about this this morning because you already know it as Christians. So this morning, I told you I want to preach about what you don't know. And what is it that you don't know? That it's true. And I know when you hear that, your first thoughts are, let's get Carolyn up here and that whole search team because they got a crazy guy up here. Because <laughs> he just said we already knew all this, right? But this morning, what I want to tell you about it is that it's true. I know you know these scriptures. I know you've heard them your whole life. And I know you're probably sitting right there saying, we know they're true, Steve. But I want to tell you that in almost 30 years of ministry, I've done many funerals. I've sat at the bedside of people who were in the process of dying. I've been at the hospital with people who have been very sick and don't know if they're going to make it. And you know, one of the things that, that I'll get around to in those instances, in those opportunities, is there'll come a time where I'll ask, do you know where you're going when you die. And, and I don't know, I, I love watching, it kind of dates me, Richard Dawson on The Family Feud. If you ever watch The Family Feud, I love that show. I always wanted this to be one of those questions. Because you know what I have found to be the number one answer? I hope so. I hope so. You know, if your answer is, I hope so, it means you have doubts. If your answer is, I hope so, then it means you have questions. <clears throat> if your answer is, I hope so, it means I don't believe what God says is true. I have doubts. My heart's not at peace in my relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, that's something we have to overcome. And I understand having doubts. I think having doubts is natural. Gallup polls have said that the percentage of this even Christians that believe the Bible is true is about 31%. And I don't think having doubts is a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. I think it means that we're human. But this is one gift. Today is about one gift that you can't have any doubts about. You need to understand that it's your gift and it's true. We have to let go of any doubts that we have about this resurrection and accept all its promises. But this is nothing new. Jesus fought this battle with doubts. In Mark 4, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, Jesus had several fishermen, his disciples, people comfortable being on the water. And you remember a great storm arises. Remember, these are, these are fishermen, people that are used to the sea, experts on the water. And they're scared. They're anxious. Why is Jesus sleeping? Doesn't he care that we're about to die? You know, what would have made this passage amazing in my mind is if during this storm, during all this chaos, that Jesus would have woke up and seen the disciples all curled up sleeping around him. Because they had Jesus with them, right? There was nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be worried about. They had Jesus. But that's not what we see. We see that they were terrified. They were afraid that they wake up Jesus and basically say to him, Hey! Don't you care that we're about to die? Hey, do something about it. And in Mark 4, 40, he says, 
Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? If we have Jesus and accepted him, we don't need to be afraid. We need to let go of our doubt because it is true. Matthew 14, we see the passage of Peter walking on the water. Peter's been with Jesus. He knows Jesus firsthand. And yes, he's had a little success. He gets excited when he first steps out of the boat and he walks on water. But then the fear of the world encircles him. And he begins to sing. And what does Jesus say to him? Jesus says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Trust me that what I'm telling you is true. Jesus even came back from the dead. Later on on the passage in Matthew 28, Jesus appears to the disciples on the mountain. And if you read the scripture, it says, When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Some doubted. The disciples, the disciples who walked with Jesus, saw the miracles firsthand. They doubt. So we're in good company. So what changed for the disciples? The Holy Spirit. We learn in Acts 2 that while the disciples were locked together in a room, not carrying out the Great Commission, not spreading the Word of God, not healing the sick, not doing what Jesus told them to do, the Holy Spirit descends upon them and they are permanently transformed. And their lives have never been the same. And now we see disciples that are unafraid and empowered to do the work Jesus calls them. What I like about that time when the Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples and they go out is after all they experience, in that moment, they finally said for themselves, it's true. They believed it. They believed it, and now they were equipped with the power to go out and tell others about Jesus Christ, about the kingdom of heaven, to heal the sick. They spread the gospel from their doorsteps to the ends of the earth, just as they were told, just as we were told. And they moved with excellence and intentionality in their mission for the world. Now, they had Jesus. So how can you know that this is true? Because we have the Word of God. And it is the truth. And we have the Holy Spirit and we confess faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and walk through the waters of baptism. The Word of God is not just a bunch of stories, fables, advice, strange, unbelievable acts. It's true. It's true. Jesus told us in the Gospel of John, if you hold to my teachings, you really are my disciples. And he says this, and this is the key. So if you hold to his teachings, if we listen to the word and hold to his teachings, then you will know the truth. And the truth is what's going to set you free. If you really want to truly be set free, then you need to believe it's the truth. And why? Why is it important for you to believe and trust that Jesus died and rose from the dead for you? Because this is a gift for your salvation and for yourself in the life you have here and now. I want to share two guarantees, two promises that you have with a life in Jesus Christ. A life with the risen Savior. Two guarantees if you believe it's true. The first is that you're saved from death. And the second is that you're saved from our sinfulness for God's glory and for the sake of others here, today, now. So let's look at those two. What does it mean to be saved from death? Well, Romans tells us, Paul tells us in Romans, that all have sinned and fallen short. 
penalty for our sinfulness is death. Yet Paul adds in 6.23 of Romans, for the wages of sin is death. It's what we deserve for our sin. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Without Christ, we don't believe it's true, we're going to die and spend eternity in hell as payment for our sins. Death in Scripture refers to a, a separation. Everyone's going to die. But some are going to live in heaven for all eternity, and some are not. This verse teaches us that eternal life is available through Jesus Christ. It's His substitutionary atonement for us. And what does that mean? It's a fancy word. Jesus Christ died in our place. He was crucified on the cross for us. We deserve to be the ones to die. We deserve to be the ones crucified because we're the ones that live sinful lives. But Christ took that punishment on for us in our place. He substituted himself. God made him who had no sin be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. You know the most famous verse of Scripture, don't you? You can say John 3.16 with me because you know it, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His one... Anybody out of this? He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have what? Eternal life. God didn't send Jesus to give you a good example on how to live your life. But he does. God didn't send Jesus to teach you about the kingdom through parables. But he does. God didn't send Jesus to be a great speaker. He was. God didn't send Jesus just to heal the sick. He did. God didn't send Jesus as just another prophet. God loved you so much that God sent Jesus Christ to die for you. To die for you for the sins that you commit here and now. So that you can have eternal life in heaven with you. I thought I almost want to somebody say amen. <laughs> That's not a hallelujah amen moment that Jesus Christ died for your sins so that you can have eternal life with him. Then we're taking it for granted. That is the glory we celebrate today. But if that's the only thing that you think today is about, then you're settling for half a gospel. The gift of resurrection today is more than just about eternal life when we die. Remember I said there are two promises that we have as a gift from the resurrection. We're saved from death and have eternal life. The second is that we are saved from our sinfulness today. We're saved from our sinfulness today for God's glory and to serve and love others. You know, if you believe it's true, then you have to live your life as someone saved, for their, saved from their sinfulness for the purpose of God's glory. And for the sake of those around you. The work of Christ on the cross, the redeeming work of Christ on the cross should be reflected in your life right now today. If you've confessed faith in Jesus Christ, if you've been baptized, received the Holy Spirit, then you have been equipped for something more today. You have to live as someone that believes it's true. Jesus gave you a few. He said in John 14, If you love me, you'll keep my commands. I've given you an example. That is, I have done, so you should do. Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Paul reminds us to be imitators of me, just as I am in Christ. We need to do that today and here. How do we do that? 
Uh, we could spend several sermons going through that, but I want to give a few today. We need to acknowledge that we sin and seek God's forgiveness. We're all sinners. We have to start there. How often, besides saying it on Sunday morning, do you forgive others as God has forgiven you? We all sin. We need to be willing to recognize that sin and be thankful that we have a Savior that forgives us of that sin each and every day. So we don't have to live in it. We don't have to be stuck in that place. We can escape that sin and be free from that right now. We need to set aside time for prayer. How much time do you spend in prayer each week? I'm going to issue you a challenge. I want you to write down during this week every time you pray. And then at the end of the week, review it. Because you might find that you think you do more than you do. We need to read, study, and be in discussion with others in the Word of God. How are we going to do that which Jesus has taught us if we're not studying it? We're not in discussion in that world. How much time each week do you spend in God's life? You need to spend time in God's word so that you can live God's word. Jesus told us the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. How are you living that out today? Do you give God more than just one day a week? How are you serving your neighbor? You have been saved from a life of sin. That's what we celebrate today. We have been saved from a life of sin. A life of sin is focused on self, my needs, my wants. And you've been called from that to do the work Jesus has commanded. You know, when you accept the truth of the gospel, your love of God and neighbor has to be above self. Now, I'm not saying you can earn your salvation by any works. You can't buy it. But if you believe it's true, who are you telling about it? Whose lives are you in the process of transforming? What kind of fruit are you producing here and now? We sell the gospel short if our salvation doesn't strengthen our love of God and neighbor in the here and now. If you believe it's true, then how are you acting upon that truth? Does your life reflect? Do people see that in your life? That you're reflecting, that you believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true? Do you practice forgiveness? Are you caring for widows and orphans? Are you stretching yourself to love your neighbors around King's Highway Christian Church and around the world? Are you praying for ways that will help this family of faith extend its reach for the gospel? You know, if we live as a resurrected people, then we must not live for what we want, but for what God wants from us. Amen. Serve others and to spread the gospel. If we are not reflecting the real life example Jesus gave us on how to love God and serve those around us, then we are settling for a watered down gospel. We are settled for a watered down resurrection. We have to believe that it is true. Because it is. Remember Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, then you are my disciples. If you hold to your own ideas, thoughts, desires, wants, then whose are you? Who's are you? God, the Father, Creator, Sustainer, sent Jesus Christ, the Messiah, so that you shall not perish but have eternal life. Our God rose Jesus from the grave on Easter so that you may spend eternity with him and that you can live the life that he's called you to. 
Do you believe it's true? Christ the Lord is risen.